Hi everyone, welcome to Mains Maxima program. So today in this particular session, we will be discussing a set of questions exclusive in the topic economy. So the first question we are going to discuss is on the topic food processing industry. So to begin with, the first question is food processing industry or FPI can benefit farmers as well as achieve food security. Based on this particular statement, we are going to discuss the potential of FPI in becoming a game changer for Indian economy. Okay, we are going to have a detailed discussion guys regarding your food processing industry. So now, we are going to talk about the food processing industry. We are going to give an introduction in this particular answer. Then we are going to talk about the potential of this food processing industry. And in this question, we will also be discussing as to what are the issues or challenges which is being faced by this food processing industry. And also finally, what steps could be taken, especially by the government in order to boost up this food processing industry. Only then they can become a game changer for the Indian economy, right? So to begin with, we'll start with the introduction as to, we know that agriculture, they provide livelihood for more than half of India's population, right? And in the previous uh, session also, I told you like more than 50% of population still depends upon agriculture, right? And now, farmer distress or agrarian distress, they have reached crisis proportions and the, what is the aim of uh, this guys uh, when there is agrarian distress or when there is a farmer distress what is the goal of uh, that particular uh, problem the goal will be to double the farmers income that is when the, there is a certain situation of distress with reference to agriculture automatically to improve the situation of farming and also that of farmers they think of doubling the income of farmers and now since this farmers distress it has reached the crisis proportions and has stated that they have want to increase the income of farmers by the year 2022. And how is that possible guys? Simply can you just increase the income of farmers? No. For that there should be a proper agriculture infrastructure and also there should be agro based services such as your procurement, processing, storage, supply chain etc. All these should be properly and efficiently maintained guys. Only then you will be able to double the income of farmers by the year 2022 as it is expected. So you can start an introduction like that. Okay. Fine. And here you have also mentioned about agro based services uh, because we are talking here about food processing industry. That is why we have to mention that particular point also. The next point that you can talk here is you are going to discuss as to what is the potential of food processing industry. For that you have to give certain statistics in order to support your answer. That is how far this food processing industry has enabled a country to grow or what are the real potentials that lies with respect to this FPI. Okay. So now you can write the first point under this is India has a major food processing economy in the world and we do know that and for major crops India's position lies in the top three guys. But though this is a situation, what happens to your uh, food processing industry? Okay, India lies in the top three position. It is also having a market, uh, you know, for major crops in the world. But with respect to your food processing industry, it is yet to take off, which means that a lot more is being done in order to improve all these food processing industry, right? The second point that you can write here is uh, some statistics you can include, guys. That is, we are contributing. That is, India is contributing only 2.2% of global food processing exports. And by providing a better food processing industry, we can ensure greater market access, especially for the farm produce. So you can even mention that point because that comes under the potential of your food processing industry. The next point is that this FPI, it has emerged as a high profit, high growth sector. That is true because the food processing industry is in relation to your agro based industry, right? Because from whatever raw materials you get from your agriculture sector, you do uh, you do bring it in your food processing industry. So that is why it is said that it is, has emerged as a high profit and high growth sector whereby your agriculture sector is also getting benefited equally, right? And now, another point is the government controlled FPI alone is 32% of India's food market which literally gives enough scope for what investments for private investment. Thus, if you see guys with reference to agriculture and uh, manufacturing sector, the FPI, that is food processing industry, they contributed to 8.6% of GVA with respect to your agriculture. And what about manufacturing sector guys? This FPI, it contributed 9.1% of GVA. So this is to show the potential of food processing industry with reference to our country. Okay, these statistics will help you to score better marks if you are adding, adding it in your answer. And now, another important advantage or potential of this food processing industry is that it re leads to a lot of employment opportunities. That is, this FPI, it creates jobs. At the same time, it also reduces wastages, which will fetch a better income for the farmers. How? By incentivizing allied sectors like your livestock, fishery, dairy sector, etc. That is yet another important potential of your food processing industry. The next point is, this FPI, that will integrate India with what? 
with your global supply chain thereby propelling india as a leading player in this particular segment what segment your food processing industry segment so all these points you can mention under the potential of food processing industry with respect to india just to show that india performs very well and also there is a lot of chances or there is a lot of way in which india can perform even more better with respect to your fpi okay thus food processing it is one of the most important part of manufacturing process and it is also a significant part of one of the most important programs of india that is the make in india program okay now so now we are going to discuss about the challenges or the issues with respect to your food processing industry because the question is all about how this food processing industry is going to be a game changer for indian economy so we have said about the introduction we have talked about the potential of fpi now it is time for us to discuss okay if this is the situation also what is the issues or challenges with respect to your food processing industry the first important point that you can mention is with reference to price fluctuations how guys that is increase yield and higher productivity they are automatically subjected to what certain price fluctuations and also the perishable nature of food products it lead to farmers realizing low prices now why is this happening guys this is really happening due to the lack of adequate storage facilities and also due to poor warehousing thus there is a need for what guys your agriculture infrastructure to be updated or upgraded right only then you can overcome this challenge fine the next important point that you can mention under challenge is that the technical barriers with respect to trade and sanitary uh, site okay which means that the sanitary measures guys under wto that is world trade organization they create problems for indian exports with reference to eu and the european union and also your us you can also mention that point guys that is also one important challenge of your food processing industry the next point is see what happens when there is an increased use of chemical guys see when there is an increased use of chemicals with reference to agriculture it leaves certain chemical residues in the yields so in such a situation what happens automatically that will be rejected by your importing countries so now since this is the biggest challenge a need is there in order to shift towards what sort of farming organic farming and nowadays we know that organic farming is on the trend and people prefer more of organic products why because the chemical products in the long run will cause a lot of issues uh, with respect to health issues for the people right so now because of this overuse of chemicals a shift towards organic farming is needed you can even mention that point guys under your challenges with respect to food processing industry and now if you see with reference to the meat exporting industry guys because of political interferences and also the political indifferences it has literally hit the meat exporting industry one such example that you can uh, quote here is with reference to the cow slaughter okay that is the slaughtering of cow that has taken a socio socio political dimension that unproductive cattle they don't even reach the markets ha thereby hampering the value change and recently you also know what has happened with reference to cow slaughtering a big issue was going in our country you can even mention that point that is also a kind of challenge with reference to your food processing industry okay the next point is certain logis uh, logistical issues with reference to your credit facilities then acquisition of land and also interrupted power supply all these points also you can mention under your challenges so with this we have uh, you know said a lot of points as to what are the issues or challenges that india faces with respect to the food processing industry now in your question you are supposed to talk about what measures could be taken specially by the government in order to make sure that this food processing industry is been really harnessed in the most efficient manner okay so now the next heading we can talk about the government intervention see now in order to make in order to incentivize your food processing industry some steps have to be taken by the government what are those steps guys we are going to discuss that now you can include all those points in your answer the first point is 100% fdi that is your foreign direct investment in trading including through e-commerce in respect of your food products manufactured or produced in india that should literally be done that the government should make sure that that 100% fdi has been taking place with reference to all these things in india that is one way in which you can make sure that your food processing industry is growing right and the next point that you can write here is that the food and agro based processing units and also your cold chain infrastructure they have been brought under the ambit of psl which is your priority sector lending and when this is the case what happened guys it will provide additional credit for pro food processing activities even that point you can mention under your government intervention the next point is that the launch of a central sector scheme just uh, just like your sampada which is a scheme basically for agro marine processing and development of agro processing clusters 
that literally create world class food processing infrastructure which is very very important because we know that india occupies a greater position with respect to agriculture worldwide right so now food processing industry also comes under that whereby we are supposed to create a very quality or a world class uh, food processing system so through this particular central uh, sponsored scheme we'll be able to do that in a better way you can even include this point also okay and now another thing that you can include here is it also subsumes the ongoing schemes such as your mega food parks your integrated cold chain and also value addition infrastructure etc and also certain new schemes like uh, you know infrastructure for agro processing clusters then creation of backward and forward linkages all this literally help in boosting up your food processing industry and you can also mention about the national mission on food processing guys because all these certain certain things in which when the government intervention is being done they make sure that a more focus is been given in order to upbring or in order to develop your food processing industry you can include all these points another important point which you have to mention here is guys see we know that it's not about the quantity that alone matters the quality also matters right so now strict enforcement of quality and hygiene is a must guys and now quality and food safety they have become competitive edge in the global market for food products thus a food safety and quality assurance infrastructure for this purpose has been set up the government has also made sure that that is there but how far this has been checked that is the next question how far we are making sure that there is quality how far we are making sure that there is hygiene that is a question so now you have to make sure that though we have all this food safety and quality assurance infrastructure also how that should be reviewed or that should be taken or implemented in the most effective way only then we can literally achieve the objective of this food processing industry or we can use this fpi as a game changer for the indian economy right thus now you can conclude your answer by giving some uh, data with reference to your food processing industry that is if you see guys india is importing about 22 billion dollar food processing products but at the same time one other important point that you have to note here is that india has about 40 billion worth food processing market so you just see the statistics here it has a worth of 40 billion worth food processing market but still they are importing about 22 billion dollar food processing products which literally means that even now till now even small time snacks like your chips biscuits everything has been imported and we know that too much of import is very bad for our economy why because when you're importing too much you're paying extra right you're not earning any foreign exchange for any country to grow always you need to make sure more of export is there because export will lead to what earning of foreign exchange import will only reduce your income right because that is even a, a kind of disadvantage for the domestic industries also right but in spite of having resources also what is our country doing that point also you can just mention to show this is what is happening this has to be has to change only then we can exactly bringing the real potentiality of a food processing industry right thus you can conclude again by saying that it is now needed that food processing services and industry they must be incentivized for farmers why so as to get a better income and also for employment generation that is for creating jobs because a lot of people will get employment with because of this food processing industry so now this has to be literally promoted guys and thus through diversification and also substituting the imports there is a huge scope for a second green revolution in fact uh, from my point of view i can tell you that yes there is a need for second uh, green revolution both with respect to our food security as also for augmenting the farmers income which means by increasing the farmers income because it is a need of the r i could tell you because it has huge scope or potential to improve so with respect to your food processing industry this is how you will answer this particular question so i hope you have clearly understood this and you can also add your own points with re reference to this particular question so the next question we are going to discuss on the topic with reference to msme that is micro small and mi medium enterprises so the question is recently the government took a decision to change the basis of classification of the micro small and medium enterprises that is the msme now examine how far do this classification system impact the sector with a special emphasis on defense industry so your question is talking about the msme and here special emphasis is on is given to your defense industry okay so for your answer you have to give a you know a, a little bit of introduction with reference to your micro small and medium enterprises and later you have to give more emphasis on to your defense industries how far this classification has impacted the defense sector okay so to begin with we know that msme that is micro small and medium enterprises that sector in india plays a very prominent role with respect to indian economy and it is even called as a pillar of economic development we all do know that right now if you see as per the revised methodology or method this msme enterprises guys they literally account for 37% of india's gdp you can include the statistics in introduction so that you'll be able to fetch uh, better marks 
Now, and this is including even your service sector, guys. Okay. Now, apart from this, the contribution of MSME even to other sector, they has been immensely instrumental. So, which literally means that MSME holds a greater position in our Indian economy. You can start your answer by boosting up about uh, MSME. Okay. The next point that you can talk about MSME is it is the biggest employer after agriculture sector. We know that agriculture sector stands number one with respect to Indian population because majority of people relies on that. Just after agriculture, it is your MSME. Lot of employment generation has been created in MSME, guys, because they generate more than 11 cro crore jobs so far. They've literally created or literally they are uh, ge uh, generating more than 11 crore jobs so far. And now it is easy to comprehend the salience of the role they play both in social and economic restructuring of India. You can just give all these points in introduction to show up the importance of MSME in our country. Okay, then, then you can talk about uh, another point that is this MSME, it has been growing at 10% over the last few years and has been extremely resilient during the time of slowdown. That is also a point that you have to mention. That is, over the years, what has been the growth of your MSME and even during the extreme uh, times, during slowdown also, how it has been. They have been resilient. Okay. But in spite of all this, this is a potential or advantage of MSME, I could tell you. But in spite of all this also, your MSME, that is your micro, small and medium enterprises, they have been facing certain problems. What sort of problems? Infrastructural problems. Now, b because of this, guys, the MSME Act of 2006, they changed the course of, uh, for, for MSME on a better path. To make it more better, they changed it. Okay, let us see what is that. See, the government has taken many steps to strengthen this sector, that is your MSME sector, and also to promote innovation. If you see certain schemes, for example, schemes like your Mudra, your Credit Guarantee Scheme, your Khadi Development Scheme, your Pradhan Mantri Employment Generation Scheme, your Make in India, etc. All these, you can give us an example in which uh, the steps taken by government in order to strengthen this particular MSME sector and thereby promoting innovation. You can just include that point, okay? But in spite of the schemes or steps taken by the government, guys, there were numerous constraints, again, which was faced by your MSME sector. And one of the key demand has been to change the classification system, which was based on what criteria? Investment in machinery criteria. That was a criteria on what it was based. Okay, now they said that uh, there, has been a, there has been a demand in order to change the classification system that was based on this particular criteria. Because according to this particular criteria, uh, the MSME was based on certain things. We'll see what they are, okay? The first one is, it limited the capacity of enterprises why they were not able to upgrade their machinery and also the production capacity and this is called as a throttled capital investment guys that is before uh, the msme uh, since it was based on the investment and machinery criteria it had certain limitations the first limitation was your throttle capital investment that is a uh, limitation was kept on the capacity of enterprises with reference to what your upgradation of machinery and also your production capacity Definitely that is having a bad effect on your uh, production, right? For, for, be it any industry, be it a small industry, medium industry or micro industry, right? That is the first constraint. The second constraint uh, based on investment in machinery criteria is that that was one of the reasons for low adoption for highly efficient and cutting edge technologies. You were not able to uh, resort to so high technology, ultrasound technologies because of this. Okay. A third uh, important uh, point that you can mention is that even though investment on machinery was high in certain companies, okay, they, they were focusing so high for investing in machineries, but what happened? Still, these companies were incurring losses and also the turnover or the profit was very, very, very low. Thus, bracketing them under such a category was irrelevant. There was no point in bracketing them under investment in machinery category because of all these constraints. You can just mention it. Why? Because to show that know this uh, MSME through based on this criteria is not efficient there is a need for change in classification okay thus now to address these concerns the union cabinet what did they say they decided to change the basis of classification of your MSME that is your micro small and medium enterprises now we're going to see how did they change the classification what did they do to you know make sure that MSME performs in a better way and this is not needed for your examination guys this particular table I'm, I've just shown you this for you to have a better understanding okay if you see the previous year classification it was uh, the ceiling on investment with reference to plant and machinery was in rupees it is it was below 25 lakhs the new classification the annual turnover is not exceeding 5 crore for your micro industries what about small small previously it was like 25 lakhs to 5 crores now it is between 5 to 75 crores you can see the huge differences right and now for medium it is again Previously, it was 5 crore to 10 crore. Now, it is 75 to 250 crore, guys. Which literally shows that there has been huge, you know, huge changes or huge amendments have been made with reference to your MSME enterprises. Okay. 
and this literally shows that the productivity will also be more because you can see the annual turnover here right from a smaller amount it has gone to a bigger amount and i think new classification literally adds to the productivity also in a greater way now this new classification of msme makes it more reliable and transparent because why more number of industries they'll be coming under the category of msme that is micro, micro small and medium enterprises definition and they also have access to the benefit whatever is offered by your msme another thing why this new classification is more reliable and transparent is that the low transaction cost as such as inspections that is not required so you can cut down the, uh, those particular low transaction cost right that is also another important benefit okay another thing is that it makes the filing of gst more simplified so it simplifies the goods and service tax filing in a very simple manner another thing is the industries they can expand their capital assets thereby they, uh, they'll be able to increase the production capacity so these are some of the important points you can mention under this okay that is this new classification has literally led to an advantage of has literally led uh, to so many factors which was very advantageous in nature so to just support that point you can give these four points and now since we had a holistic view regarding MSME that how far MSME has been uh, effective the potential of MSME at the same time we also discussed regarding your MSME new classification and also I have shown you the table like how far it has uh, changed and what is the benefit of that new classification and all now as per your question is demanding you are supposed to talk about the defense sector more emphasis is given on your defense industries so now your next heading could be the defense sector that is what the new system has in store for MSME micro uh, small and medium enterprises so now if you see in the defense sector alone as many as 6000 MSME that is a micro small and medium enterprises units they have been supplying components and also sub assemblies to both the public as well as the private companies and we know the defense is very important for any country guys it comes under on, it comes under your uh, non plan expenditure or your unproductive expenditure because they are not directly yielding or giving you any you know uh, uh, any returns uh, uh, returns but it is used for the maintenance of country as a whole we need defense also right so now if you see that is literally there have been like around 6000 msme units okay both with reference to public and private sector companies fine now nearly 800 they are engaged with what the defense research and development organization that is that is your drdo you can mention that point to show that the importance of defense sector okay then if you next you can talk about the defense offset that is the offset policy of the defense ministry it permits foreign vendors to avail benefits that is a 1.5 multiplier now how can they avail benefit guys if they discharge the obligation through a local partner that is uh, for example the indian offset partner only then they'll be able to make sure the benefit has been reaching the targeted things okay that is yet another important point that you can talk here another point is that the proposed limits on annual turnover that literally enable a large number of companies to qualify as your msmes thereby providing a wider base for foreign companies to choose it as iop what is it iop guys indian offset partner okay and now this policy along with your defense procurement policy which is still in process it is not exactly done completely it's still in process only your defense uh, procurement policy it seeks to align with the make in india initiative of the government and literally it can bring a lot of benefits to which sector your micro small and medium enterprise sector okay that point also you can mention thus another scheme uh, for your different sector is your make procedure guys that is some projects they have been exclusively reserved for your msme that is micro small medium enterprises for the design, development and manufacture of your equipments, system, subsystem, assemblies, sub-assemblies, your major components and also upgrades by Indian companies and that is called as your make procedure. Okay, that particular point also you can include here under your uh, defense. Okay, if you see that again this table is not required uh, for your exam just for you to understand. If you see the under this make procedure, if you see make one uh, ministry funded, you can see the reserve MSME. I told you some projects are reserve MSME. In that projects up to 10 crore will be reserved. And the category is make one ministry funded again under make to uh, industry funded projects up to three crore comes in that that will be reserved under your msm that is micro uh, small and medium enterprise you can just just for your understanding this table is there no need of writing for your exam thus you can conclude your answer by writing like this guys the changes in the on the base of classification literally enables your msme to be in a much much better position in order to undertake all these projects without bothering or putting a lot of you know botheration uh, regarding your investment with respect to both your plant and machinery that is a point which you can you know mention under your conclusion thus again you can say with respect to your defense your defense technology development fund that is your tdf okay those funds fund projects by grants to both public and private sector now the msme can also collaborate with that guys how 
making sure that the researchers and academia uh, with respect to development of uh, defense is given a lot of emphasis thereby the dual use of technologies under these projects which are funded from your tdf that is your defense technology development funds can be utilized so this is how we can conclude this particular answer with reference to msme and more special emphasis is given on your defense sector and you can also include your points uh, more points with reference to defense sector if you get it no problem so i hope you have clearly understood with reference to what is an msme and how far ms what is the potential of msme and also with reference to defense sector how much msme is important for your defense sector what potential it has in order to boost up the defense industry so the next question is about your ham model that is hybrid annuity model and this topic comes under investment model in your syllabus and the previous uh, years question if you see you have got a question with respect to airport under your uh, ppp that is your public private partnership or investment models right so now in this year you can explain a question under your investment models from your ham that is hybrid annuity model so now the question is hybrid annuity model are not a panacea for the delays in highway development but certainly a better alternative discuss how this ham is different with other models so in this question we are going to discuss how this hybrid annuity model is uh, different from other models or how can it be an alternative in fact okay for that you have to give a description about what is ham and also you have to talk about uh, you know certain important public private partnership models or investment models to have a better understanding as to how does this ham functions or operates how can it be a better alternative so to begin with guys in introduction you can say, say that the government has an ambitious road development program we do know that because it comes under infrastructure development right now which is aimed at doubling the national highway network in the next 5 years and many projects for improving the infrastructure sector it has been approved uh, such as your bharat mala pariyojana etc and for the success of all these initiative what do you require guys this for the success of such initiative we require active and working models of ppp that is a public private partnership that will literally be very active only then whatever schemes or models introduced by the government can be said to be successful and active okay fine now if you see in the national highway sector there has been three models and to address the issues arising out of them this particular model called as ham that is your hybrid annuity model they were approved by the government in the year 2015 and in this particular question we are going to discuss about the importance of ham okay now if when you are going to discuss about ham you are going to talk about certain uh, you know investment models that is your built operate transfer with reference to built operate transfer and toll and built operate transfer bot and equity we are going to see that only then we will be able to discuss about ham in a better way okay so now the first one you can talk about the bot toll that is built operate transfer and toll that is under this guys the private party they are responsible for building the project which means that in order to acquire the land in order to procure the raw material in order to design and construct the road etc that is the private party bearers uh, uh, they they literally bears the construction risk that is what uh, comes under built operate transfer and toll okay another point is that these private parties they operate and maintain the road during concession period as per agreed specifications and now during this concession period what happens they collect the toll see because we are talking about what guys we are talking about built operate transfer and toll how is this built operate transfer which is a model which is an investment model or which is a public private partnership model has a relationship with toll you know what is a toll right a collection that you make so we are going to we are connecting it and talking it talking here okay so now during the, that concession period only they collect the toll thus what do they do they able to recover the cost via toll collected during concession period because to construct all the all these roads or to make sure the infrastructure is proper you need to incur expenditure right because it's a it's a it's a combination of public and private partnership right so how can they recover the cost they through this collection of toll okay that is what you have to mention under this a bot and toll and now in this particular model guys the private party as i told you again they bear the construction risk the operation and management risk and also the commercial risk you have to also mention that all the entire risk has been uh, bared by the private party itself though it is a uh, public private partnership model also the entire risk is borne by the private person that also you have to mention here so definitely they'll try to recover the cost right so that is again through toll now thereby the government awards a contract to the party that's a private party which is willing to share maximum toll revenue with the government thereby the viability gap funding is provided for certain unviable projects so this is how the built operate transfer and toll functions okay thus this bot and toll they entailed too much risk and thereby the private developers they were not willing to invest in the project very to because very true because all the sort of risk i told you 
with reference to your construction risk, O&M risk and also commercial risk has been literally borne by whom? The private parties. In such a situation, they will not be willing, you know, to uh, go for such kind of projects, right? So thus, the government made sure that, you know, so the private parties are there to take. But under this, the since more most of the risk has been done by the private developers, they were not at all willing to invest in this particular project. You can mention that particular point. Now, the second one is your BOT with respect to annuity. That is your built operate transfer and annuity. Now, what is annuity, guys? It means a series of equal payments at regular intervals. You're making payments which is very equal at certain regular intervals. Okay. Now, this BOT uh, annuity, it was designed by in order to mitigate the risk of private players. That is to make sure that these private parties or players, they are able to minimize their risk. Now, this model is exactly similar to your BOT toll. That is BOT toll also again. Who was bearing the entire risk? The private people. Same thing here also, guys. This model is similar to your BOT toll except that Private party does not bear commercial risk of operating toll. That is the only difference. But the rest, everything has been done by the private party. But with reference to toll, the private party does not bear the commercial risk. That is the only difference. You have to make a note of it. The next point is that the NHAI. The, and what is this NHAI, guys? It's the National, uh, National Highway Authority of India. Okay. Now, the developer that demands minimum annuity will be selected. And how they would, that, that is there again. Whoever is demanding a minimum annuity, they will be selected and they will come under the BOT annuity. BOT that is built operate transfer annuity program okay so now you can also talk about the EPC guys uh, under this that is your engineering procurement construction actually this uh, EPC it is not a PPP project that is a public partnership project why I'm going to mention here is because you can you can just see the sub uh, subsiding points that is the private party they only design the project they acquire raw material and also they construct the road fine now immediately after construction guys this road is transferred to who your NHAI that is again your National Highway Authority of India, right? Just to do the work only this private party is there. Immediately after that, the control has been handled over to your NHAI. Now, this private parties or this private players, what do they literally behave as? They behave as a contractor and thereby who construct the roads. They don't have any ownership rights. You understand? That is why, uh, you know, I told you to mention about e, uh, EPC. Now, since upfront payment by the government, it was attracting the private players. But still guys, though it is like, that, though it attract the uh, private pe people also, it is putting a certain constraint or a strain on the finance of government. Because in this model, the government bears all the risk while leaving little for the private. Because under this particular thing, it's the government who bears most of the risk and a little of risk has been borne by the private party. It is not like completely they're bearing it. So you can mention about that also. And now we are going to discuss about your ham. So now we are going to discuss about your hybrid annuity model because only if you know about your BOT and your EPC, you will be able to discuss about this. So why? Because this ham is a mixture of your EPC and your BOT annuity. Because in this model, if you see, the first point is that the private players, they don't collect toll, but they recover investment via annuities, guys. And now second point is that the government provide 40 percentage of project cost. And thus the private players or the private parties, they bring 60% of capital. And we know that the private people do have a lot of funds, so majority will be put by them. Okay, thus the NHAI, what will they do? That is the National Highway Authority of India. They literally pay annuity over the concession period. When the work has been done, when they transfer that uh, uh, construction of road the, I mean, uh, uh, to this NHAI, they will pay annuity over the concession period. That is how this has been done, guys. Thus, the private players, they will be responsible for, your ON, uh, for the operation and management of this particular project. Thus, the operation management risk are there for the private while the financial risk has been shared between the private as well as the public parties. That is how they do in case of HAM. Okay. Now, as per your question, how is this HAM different from other model? So now, is HAM, that is your hybrid annuity model, a better alternative? Or how far it is different from other model in a better way? That is what we are going to discuss now. So you can give a heading like this and you can say that the advantage of HAM, what is that? It gives enough liquidity to the developer and also the financial risk that is shared by the government. That is one of the most important advantage of your hybrid annuity model. And other important inclusions in this model is your inflation adjusted project cost over time that is also another important advantage of your ham guys okay that is why it can be taken as a better alternative over the other models next point is that the life cycle cost as a parameter for awarding contracts that is also there in case of your ham guys the next point is there is sharing okay that is one of the underlying aspects of this model because i told you it is not the private players or the parties who exclusively share the risk under your ham model though it is a uh, you know in a public private partnership model 
though majority of contribution is done by the private sector also here the government also equally shares the risk that that burden has been transferred okay so that is one of the most important advantage to make ham alternative model now another point is all regulatory clearances risk your compensation risk your commercial risk and also your traffic risk that is borne by the government so now what happens to private sector guys the risk for them is minimal or it is a minimum because when the risk is minimum only it will increase the private parties to come and take up those projects otherwise what will happen they'll be hesitant or they'll be not willing to take up those projects at the end of the day all these projects will be delayed because we know that government is having a huge public debt whereby all these projects you know because of lack of adequate fund it keep pending 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 right so in this case when they are doing like this it will encourage the private sector to come and take a lot of projects right and now next point that you can mention here is the private is known for better expertise very true and also for better quality of services hence the onm will be perfectly efficient with reference to your uh, private sectors so now we can conclude this particular question by saying that steps should be taken to check the aggressive bidding which may lead to unviable projects and also increase what your credit risk guys of banks thereby putting a strain on what the stressed balance sheet you can conclude it by like that and also you can say that there should be significant or vital improvements in order to make uh, the participation more effective or in order to make sure that uh, you know uh, the participation by the both the private sector has been more efficient including easier norms for access it should not be so you know inconvenient for them it should not be so rigid whereby the private entities will not even feel to come in so make sure that improvements have been made to boost participation in also including norms for exit also that is when they want to leave they can leave okay thus both the governments and the developers what they should do guys they have to do a their bit in strengthening the ro a roadway infrastructure for which a working model like your ham that is a hybrid anti model is required to kick start all the stalled projects because we know a lot of projects has been uh, is been pending for us in order to be a kick start or be a incentive or be a motivation for all the projects something a model called as ham should be there so i hope you've clearly understood how this hybrid annuity model could be a alternative or it could have an advantage over certain other models so with this we have come to the end of the session and i hope all the questions we have discussed has provided you with a clear cut idea how to approach the answers and you can also include uh, your points with reference to all these question so thank you guys and stay tuned for more upcoming videos